care about on, on these doors. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. So, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, it's a very nice workshop, and, uh, and I'm honored to speak at it. So, I'm going to talk to you today about a new electronic architecture that Investment for Honics has been working on for a number of years. And I've got kind of a, a big, bold talk, but you know, if you're the type of guy that quit your day job and start a company, uh, you got to believe your own pitch, and I certainly believe it. So, uh, I call it a new electronic way about architecture and the unprecedented devices that it enables. An alternate title for the talk might have been The Underappreciated Power of Delta N Now. By this, Delta N, I mean how much you can change the index of refraction, and L, your interaction. And why this is so important will hopefully become clear throughout the talk. So, very briefly, some background about Western Photonics. Uh, we are a small business, we're quite small, only eight employees. We're located in Denver, Colorado. And we've got two areas, primary areas of technical focus. One is phone out enabling equipment and technology. Uh, this uses some liquid crystal devices, but it's not really about liquid crystals. And then the other is new electronic replacements for mechanics. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce a new and potent method to satisfy the long-standing need to actively control light. And by actively controlling light, I mean that in the most general sense. So redirecting or steering, switching it on or off, dynamic focus control, filtering it, uh, delaying or storing it, analyzing the spectrum of it, whatever you can think of. Now, people have wanted to actively control light for centuries. And uh, historically, they've used optical mechanics. And I was, you know, couldn't sleep one night. I was thinking, what's the oldest example of people using optical mechanics? And I was proud of myself. I was thinking, well, the Lighthouse of Alexander, it was 290 BC. They had these big mirrors, and people actually moved them. And it was beam steering. And you know, I told this to my partner, and he said, I've got an older one. Uh, the eye, dynamic focusing, or just your eye, little shutters. And that goes back since forever. So controlling light is very, very old. In more recent 20th century history, uh, traditional optical mechanical systems didn't meet modern needs, where the modern needs are primarily size, mass, power consumption, and speed. So us being the clever species that we are, invented new approaches. And there has been a huge amount of uh, money and effort geared towards sort of two primary ones. One is MEMS, microelectromechanical systems, and another one which has really been fueled by the telecom revolution and the burst was active integrated optics or waveguides. Well, these were controlled by thermal optics, where they would just heat the glass up or down to change the index, uh, EO polymers, and traditional EO materials, things like lithium diamond. Literally billions and billions of dollars have been spent and continue to be spent on the development of MEMS and what I call traditional active waveguides. And you know, this is a picture out of Bell Labs of one of the first tilt mirrors. It's, it's a great marketing picture. You know, people see that and go, wow, that's cool. Let's fund billions of dollars on that. And they have. They spent a tremendous amount of money on mounds, microring structures, array waveguide gratings, uh, waveguide output filters, huge amount of past effort. Well, I would argue that we have a dramatically lower cost and often higher performance alternative to all of this. And so the architecture I'm going to talk to you about today can do everything that MEMS can do with light, this architecture can do with light. Everything EO polymers can do, this work, this, this architecture can actually do. Everything thermal optics can do, this architecture can do. And there are things that this architecture can do that no other technology I'm aware of can. So, how do you control light? Well, like people before us, we use electro optics. An electro optic is just something where you can change the index of refraction by applying voltage. That usually manifests itself as a voltage tube by refringence. And so, for example, if you've got a chunk of electro-optic material, you put in polarized light, you can apply a voltage, you can change the optical phase delay between the two polarizations. What's, okay, how can this be used to replace mechanics? 
Well, here's a very simple example. So take a mechanical system where you've got mechanical control over time delay. You've got a launch beam, a movable mirror, and a detector. A nice linear relationship between mirror displacement and transit time. If you wanted to do the same thing, but get rid of the mechanics, well, you put a new material in there. And then when you apply voltage, you change the index of refraction, you change the phase velocity of the light, you've got the same linear relationship, but now between voltage and transit time, you've done the same thing, but replaced the mechanics. What is not immediately obvious is that if you can do enough of this, you can replace all of optical mechanics. Anything you can envision with optical mechanics, you can replace. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the index of refraction for typical linear materials, things like lithium niobate, barely changes at all with voltage. Bulk lithium niobate, your delta N will change maybe 10 to the minus 7 per volt. So if you look at your optical phase delay, you can maybe get one or two waves you know, people talk one or two ways of strip, stroke, or uh, OPD, which is fine if you're just making a modulator a switch, but it's hardly a viable replacement for moving a mirror. So how do you get bigger? Well, here's this product, delta N, L. You either gotta get bigger L, or you gotta bigger delta N. You know, bigger L, something like lithium I made, I don't know, call it Cleveland Crystals and say, well, it's longer and longer and stuff. Uh, even if they could make it, I wouldn't want to see the quote. So it's just not practical. So you've got to get the bigger delta N. Well, you get bigger delta N. You know, this crowd knows this. You get to bigger delta N by liquid crystals. Tremendous electronic effect. Standard display type LC, you change delta N by 0.2 and 5 volts. You know, it's kind of a fun exercise to convert that into an R matrix value, which is what the typical EO folks normally talk about. And depending on how you do it, that's something like 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth picometers per volt. Compared to normal lithium nibate, it's a factor of 100,000 or a million times bigger. I mean, it's amazing. Nature doesn't typically throw you a factor of a million, but here they do. It's environmentally and thermodynamically stable, it's passed out Cordia standards, it's been space qualified, it's low cost manufacturing, you can make really pretty pictures like Dave Walla does. You can do cool things with those LCs too. You know, some other EO liquid crystal facts there's two types of responses in liquid crystals. There's the kind of traditional one, where you actually have molecular motion, and that's got time scales in the microseconds to milliseconds, and that's where you get these huge uh, electrolytic responses. There's some new materials that we have from uh, Professor Wu at Creole. You can get delta N of 0.8 or 5 volts. I mean, my god, that's huge. LCs also can operate in an electronic motion regime, where it can be very, very fast. And so this is instead of sloshing the nuclei around, we're sloshing electron clouds around. And that can have time scales on tens or hundreds of gigahertz or even faster. And this is something Dave Wall and I are, are going to do and try for too long. Some more liquid crystal facts. Uh, it, you know, your standard pneumatic is optimal for operational temperature ranges from minus 40 to 100 degrees C. You know, of course it gets slow down there, but it still works. Demonstrated radiation hardness. Uh, I think there are folks who are going on linear here. Uh, they zap these things with some radiation. There's a study by Air Force Research Labs where they're looking at photonics components for space. They found that their acoustic modulators were falling apart in the presence of radiation and they replaced them with liquid crystals because it was more radar. Optical power handling, if you get rid of the transparent electrodes at the Omega Laser in Rochester, they're handling good five tools per centimeter squared in a one nanosecond pulse. I mean, that's just tremendous power densities. They can only microwatts of electrical power. They routinely pass telecom standards, which are very difficult. You know, it's got to work on your eruption or a mountain in the desert. So they're, they're great. You know, it's enabled a multi-billion dollar display industry. Uh, it's also enabled arguably some of the best non-mechanical beam steerers. Uh, people like Over Nonlinear Systems, Metal Art, Rockwell, uh, Paul McMahon, Man Wright Patterson Air Force Base have used these to make tunable diffraction gratings, or switchable diffraction gratings, or optical phase arrays. What's wrong with liquid crystals? So how come we still have gimbals and mechanics? Well, I like to talk about the LC stigma, which when we're out there fighting a proposal in the aerospace, people think, oh, LCs are slow, they're low tech, not sexy. You know, of course, from a business point of view, low tech is good, that means you can make it, it's gonna work. I don't need a billion dollar foundry to get the thing to work. LCs are lossy. You know, like any stigma, there are elements of it based in truth. So if you look at a traditional liquid crystal optic, you've got two pieces of glass, light comes through it, goes through transparent electrodes, and then the LC is actually divided into kind of two regions. You align the liquid crystal with an alignment layer, and you've got a region that's proximate to that alignment layer. 
And that region is very highly ordered because it's right near the line of layer. And it responds to decreases in voltages quite rapidly. Then you've got this bulk region, which is slow, <coughs> lower order, higher loss, higher scatter. The problem with LCs, the real problem, is that as you try to make this L be bigger, this bulk region becomes more and more dominant. It gets slower and slower and more and more lossy. So that's the real kicker in terms of getting rid of and replacing mechanics, is that the cell has to be thin. Typical LC cells are 10 microns, 20 microns. You know, you can build a 200 micron cell and it'll take five minutes for the thing to, to uh, relax. And you also transmit to the electrodes, which is problematic. So you have this kind of funny engineering dilemma. You want to get a big delta NL product. And so you have things like neocrystals, like lithium niobate, where L, you can propagate per centimeter of lithium niobate, no problem. But delta N is prohibitively small. And then you go to LCs, and delta N goes up a factor of a million. But then your length, L, goes down a factor of 100,000, because you can only be 10 microns. You're still winning. You still make optical phase arrays out of LCs. You don't make them out of lithium niobate. But you still don't have that viable replacement for mechanics. So, how do we fix it? Well, step one, we start with the piece of pedo silicates. If humanity has learned anything in the 20th century, it's how to turn sand into silicon. They can do it very well. It's a great starting point. When we started our company, we bought our first silicon wafers on eBay. You know, it was a, a tech crash, and so you could get tons of this stuff for like a quarter each. Uh, cheap, easy. If you pedo it, they can serve as an electrode, and they can be very high quality. Atomically flat. Then you grow a layer of thermal oxide on top. If you just leave silicon out in the air, you grow a layer of thermal oxide on top. You know, there's some better ways to do it. But you're basically growing a thin layer of glass. It's a very good optical quality. It's got an index of about 1.44. Then you apply a high index coating. And there's really a variety of coatings you can do. You know, you want your index to be something like greater than 1.5. You dice it up. And now you have optical waveguides. Okay, what's an optical waveguide? Well, an optical waveguide, fiber optic is the most common optical waveguide. Fiber optics are cylindrical optical waveguides. We are light is trapped in a high index core and it can't escape into the lower index clouds. And in slab, or planar optical waveguides, you have basically two flavors of light. You've got transverse electric, where light is polarized uh, parallel to the surface, and transverse magnetic, where the light is polarized perpendicular to the surface. And this light skims along that layer. So waveguides, think about waveguides, they're kind of funny things. So if you look at a waveguide, if you look at the profile, if you're in the subclad, that's a low index, can be in the core, that's a high index, and then you have lower index top clouds. If you solve Maxwell's equation for a structure like this, where these dimensions are comparable to the wavelength of your light, you'll get a solution. And your wave function, so this is basically the intensity of the electric field through these regions. Your wave function is sampling the index in the core, plus index in lower clouding and index in upper clouding. So what's the phase velocity of the light? What is the index of it? The index is a spatial average over all of those regions. And the weighting function of the average is the solution to Maxwell's equations. And this map is exactly the same as the map you know, from your intro physics class solving uh, particle and square law potential. And depending on your dimensions and your index contrast, you can get higher order modes, or you can make it be single mode. Typically, you want to make it be single mode to make, make life easy. So, okay, we can make waveguides, but we still don't have a replacement for optical mechanics. Still no giant, giant tunable OPD or, or delta NL. So the idea is you build a standard liquid crystal cell on top of a slab waveguide, on top of an otherwise air clad waveguide. So you take a beam of light, you focus it down into this sheet, this high index sheet. Air will be in the top cladding here. You build a standard LC cell in this section, and then it can go back to air and leave. Let's look at a cross section right in here. So right in here, so if this is the high index core, <coughs> this is LC in the upper cladding, this is the lower cladding, you can make this be P-doped. You can put an electrode on top, and it doesn't have to be ITO, because so the light never goes through. If you apply a voltage to here, between here, you can tune the index of the upper planet. And so down here, this is, it's kind of hard to see, but this is, say, index of subcladding, index of core, and then the index of the top cladding for different values of voltage. 
So you can solve, you know, you read ST Rules book, you can solve for the director profile up here, and you can get, you can basically change the index up here. And so what that means is if you solve Maxwell's equation, as you change the voltage, you change the average. So you're changing the phase velocity of the light. Okay, this seems like a crazy thing to do. Why would you do it? Why is it smart? Well, it's smart for three primary reasons. One, the light only interacts with the very best part of the LC. That's that surface layer. That's low scatter loss and high speed. So if you go back here, this is representative of basically your intensity profile of your light. You're only, via your evidence of penetration, you're only interacting with the surface layer of that LC. So it means low scatter loss and higher speed. Two, there's no idea to go here. So that means higher optical power. And three, this is the real kicker. The propagation link is now decoupled from the thickness of the LC layer. So if we've got, we can make this be a nice five or two micron thick LC layer, but we can now propagate through millimeters, centimeters, tens of centimeters. So we get to exploit the huge index modulation of liquid crystals and we get beta out. So both bigger L and bigger L dump it in. We call this the electroevanescent effect. We didn't invent the electroevanescent effect, but I think uh, as far as we know, we're the first ones to call it that. <coughs> Here's some typical data uh, with a variety of different LCs and a variety of different uh, alignment layers. But typical performance would be by 50 volts, you get an index modulation of 0.02. This is what our LC that in bulk would have an index modulation of 0.2. So you're down in order of magnitude, because only about 10% of your light is in the LC layer. Okay, so instead of being a million times bigger than lithium ion you're you're 100,000 times bigger than lithium ion You're still really winning. And it's very low loss. It's hard for us to measure the loss in these. If you do it right, you can get the losses to less than 0.3 dB per centimeter, which is amazingly low. So we can propagate through millimeters and centimeters of this stuff. So here's an example where we set up a, a microcylinder barometer. You've got a long coherence length laser beam. One beam goes through the waveguide, one beam goes around it. As you apply voltage, you change the phase lag between them. Every time you go from constructive to destructive interference, you've changed the phase one wave. So instead of having a modular that has one or two waves of stroke, we can have hundreds or thousands of waves of stroke. Here's a device where we got uh, an optical phase delay of greater than one millimeter. And there it is next to the dime. So a little teeny guy getting a millimeter phase delay, that's like bouncing light off a mirror and moving the mirror a millimeter. But you're not moving anything at all. You're just applying a voltage. And a millimeter, that's macroscopic. You can see that. So finally, we have a compact and simple EO replacement for mechanical mirror movement. <coughs> and if you can do that, there's a whole world of things you can do. Here are examples of devices we have built so far, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. You can make a Fourier transfer spectrometer on a chip. You can make non-mechanical laser scanners. You can make tunable filters, tunable add drops for telecom applications. You can make broadly tunable lasers all on a chip without any moving parts. You can also do true time delays, optical coherence tomography, millifluidic mixers, uh, mock center sensors, and on and on and on and on. Applications across defense, industry, and research. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples of devices that we made with this, this architecture. So first example, build a new generation of EO laser scanners. This is a good one to start with because it's conceptually easy to understand. Uh, everyone understands the beam, the laser beam standing around. So <coughs> here's a movie, and I'll explain what this movie is. But basically there's a device. This is 1550 nanometer light, uh, near infrared light. And then there's a spot on a car, and we're scanning it around. And I'll explain how it works. You know, very small, chip scale, no moving parts. So, acknowledge the funders. This was funded by two folks at Air Force Research Labs, Don Snyder and Charles Lee at AFOSR. Um, why are they funding this? They want to do laser rangefinders on little teeny UAVs. And so, things like autonomous navigation, uh, sense and avoid, collision avoidance, a terrain mapping surveillance. Um, and when I say little teeny UAVs, I mean little things like the, the new Dragon Eyes and Batman, and they've got all these crazy names for this stuff. The little things that people carry around in backpacks. And those, people talk about 
when you work with military guys, they always have progressive acronyms. They talk about SWAT, size, weight, and power. There just was no solution for it. Gal was a two power consumptive, AM was a two power consumptive, piezos are high voltage and not enough scan angle. Uh, liquor crystal aqua phase arrays don't give you enough scan angle unless you stack them and you start to throw away your, your uh, basically weight and power advantage. They want to rugged, vibration immune, so they want non mechanical. You know, what they want, you know, when you talk to these guys, they always they ask for a move. They want some kind of magic light bending material. Something where it's a block, you put a beam of light in, you've got one voltage that scans it in the plane, another voltage that scans it out of the plane. They want it to be fast, scanning kilohertz, uh, low loss, they want to be able to get up to big apertures. It's crazy. Well, we can work the magic. We're the engineers. We don't believe in magic. And so, in plane scanning, we've developed, we're not done with development, we're shipping devices, prototype ship, uh, product launch this summer, we're almost out of time, where's George? Uh, this might be fall. Uh, in plane and out plane scanning in the works. So let me describe how that works. So, before we talk about how it works, I have to introduce the metric of how to think about non mechanical beam steering. There is one metric for non mechanical beam steering, and it is the number of resolvable spots. It's not scan angle, it's not aperture size, it's the product of the scan angle times aperture size. For any given scan angle, you can scale that up to any aperture. For any given aperture, or for any given scan angle, you can scale the aperture down and get whatever angle you want, <coughs> just with dimensional optics. So the real metric is this thing called number of resolvable spots. It's defined by if you've got a scan angle, theta max, and then you've got a given aperture size that diverges via Gaussian propagation, then that diffraction limit divergence, if you take your total scan angle and divide it by that diffraction limit divergence, that's your number of resolvable spots. So that means in the far field, how many different resolvable spots can you have? And the scale says basically theta max, how far you can scan, and how big an aperture you can scan. It also scales. So refractive steers, all refractive steers steer via refraction. So they're called refractive steers. And it's all fundamentally comes down to basically having some sort of non-normal interface where you're changing the index of this material in here <coughs> with respect to out here, the voltage, and then you get a Snell's law steer. If you work through the numbers, the number of resolvable spots for a refractive shear scales as, guess what? The product delta N L. Delta N is how much you can change the index of this medium, and L is how big this can be. If you take a standard LC display, you can change delta N 0.2, even 0.8, but you can't make a wedge very thick because it gets incredibly lossy. So your L is very small. So that's why you have to go to things like optical phase arrays, tunable refraction gradients, rely on refraction rather than refraction. So with us, we can now get huge delta NLs. So the way to make an EO scanner is you just pattern your prism onto your top electrode. Then we can change the effective index inside here, and then we can change the phase delay of the phase run on this side versus that side over a millimeter. You first think about this, the nice part about lithography is anything you can think of, you can draw. You say, okay, well, I'm gonna make a little electrode shape like a wedge. You think a little bit more and say, well, why don't I make an electrode shape like this? So I have a whole slew of non-normal interfaces. Still all one electrode. I can accrue more and more refraction as it propagates down there. Then you go, well, why not electrode shape like this? So I can, two electrodes, I can scan down and scan up. Then the problem with this is if you scan too far, your light scans past downstream electrodes and you can't scan anymore. So you come up with a whore electrode where your aperture basically encompasses, expands to capture your scan range as it propagates down there. <coughs> we thought we were just level with electrode and then you, you, know, you, you go to the library and a guy named Trimcher uh, applied optics, not using LC, but has a very similar structure. <coughs> so I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, you can also do you know, anything you can draw. You can draw lenses or wavefront corrections. You can make tunable lenses. You, anything you can draw, you can make the tunable optic. So here's an example of one of these horn structures. With only two electrodes, we were able to steer a millimeter aperture over 80 degrees. 40 degrees up, 40 degrees down. The number of resolvable spots is greater than 700 resolvable spots. In terms of what people have done in the steering, this is so you know, 
far beyond what folks have done in the past. It's huge. There's the guy that did it. It's only two electrodes, very simple drawing of electronics. We've been wrapping telecom style packaging around these devices. So there's an example of there's George who's sitting up there. He's running around across the parking lot and scanning a beam above his head. And so we've got this nice little package. We've got a little teeny battery powered driver that will run off of a battery for a very long time. The thing only takes microwatts a lot of power to run. And we've got a little teeny scanner. I don't know what I was doing. Was, people think I should have tried to track George, but I was just playing. What can this technology do? So here's this movie you saw before. There's the waveguide device. It's hitting the car. We're looking at the back of the car. And so in terms of speed, random point jumps. So from random point to random point, depending on where you're going, that happens in tens to hundreds of microseconds. The slowest time speed is when you steer all the way out and you turn the voltage off and wait for it to come back. That happens in about 500 microseconds, which is about an order magnitude faster for pneumatics, which is these things take about a factor of 10 more voltage. You know, everything makes sense when you think about it. If you want to get this much, much faster, you know, that's why we work with guys like uh, Dave Walla who work with his connected materials. But those are still in progress. So we can do full sweep rates at about 2 kilohertz. Current aperture size is in the 1 to 5 millimeter range. It's basically how big this horn is at the entrance. And there's a trade off. The bigger the aperture, the more normal your interface is, the less you steer. So it comes down to that number of resolvable spots, or delta NL. You don't get anything for free. It's not refractive, so there's no side lobes. Near refraction will get output beams. It's like coming out of a single one fiber. It's analog steering. So you can get 700 or even 1,000 resolvable spots. That doesn't mean you've only got 1,000 positions you can hit. You can divide a spot as much as your signal and noise on your analog control is. So we can get up to uh, new designs, get up to 1,000 resolvable spots, one of these is a remarkably simple device. So what about next generation designs? What are we working on now? Well, we're getting larger scalable apertures and full 2D steering, just real quick. Uh, I can't show you how we're doing this because my lawyer would yell at me, but we have new designs that basically allow us to get up to a couple centimeters on an aperture. Of course, then you've got to put it on a big substrate. Well, you can get silicon in really big substrates. And in principle, you don't have to use silicon. You know, you could use display glass. Really, whatever's cheaper. Okay, how do we get steering in the second dimension? So you can do 1D line scans, which there is a whole world of applications for. But ideally, you like random 2D scans. You need to steer light out of the waveguide. How do you get light out of the waveguide? Well, what you do is you lower, thin out your subclad, and then the light taps out. This again is just Snell's law. The angle at which the top taps out is given by the index of the material that you're coupling into or out coupling into and the effective index of your waveguide. And so if you tune the effective index up here, you tune the angle that comes out. So you can have a waveguide device. So normally we've been steering like this, but now we can steer like this too. If you put two of them together, I need to, all the great stuff was, there's a guy at Bell Labs in 1971 who basically invented couplers like this, not putting LC on top, got kind of even Ulrich and so We came where uh, George actually found his paper, we call them tunable Ulrich couplers. It's an amazing paper. <coughs> so you can put in-plane and out-plane steering, and you can have a, a block of material that basically out of the end facet, you're scanning in two dimensions. We haven't built this yet. If you run the numbers and say, okay, let's say we can do the engineering on everything. Let's say we can get silicon core waveguides to work. The nice part about silicon is a very high index, and so you can get high intensity of your light in the LC region, and it drops off fast, so it's in a low scattering region. Then you can get index modulations, waveguide index modulations, up around 1.2. You run the numbers, and that says with two of these devices back to back, you can get a full two posture ratings of coverage for one centimeter size aperture. I mean, that's just an astounding, even on paper, you know, you're gonna, we're going to run into tons of technical problems, I know. But even if you're, in order of magnitude less than this, 
but still in the mix of this all. Okay, that's bean steering. Let me run through in the little time I have left some other applications of this technology. One of them is Fourier transfer spectroscopy for chemical analysis. In a standard FTIR, you basically have a broadband light source that goes into a Michelson linear ferrometer. You move one of the arms, and <clears throat> then you combine them again, you get an interferon. Take the Fourier transfer of that, it gives you your spectrum. If you've got stuff either here or here, you can see the absorption spectrum. People have been wanting to miniaturize this for a long time. So the way we do it is we fold the two arms of the Michelson interferometer on top of one another. So one arm we call T polarization, another we call TM polarization. Put it into an LC waveguide. Then as you apply voltage here, you vary the optical phase delay or the optical path difference, just like you would in the Michelson interferometer. And then you have a polarizer here that recombines them. That gives you an interferogram. That's a known part to Michelson linear interferometer folded onto a chip. So we've built these for Jet Propulsion Labs uh, for NASA. And so here's an example of a device where if you've got a single mode light, your Fourier transform a laser, your Fourier transform of a delta function is a sine wave. Here's the interferogram of a sine wave. If you've got two delta functions, you've got two sine waves, you get the beat note between them. Uh, <coughs> here's examples of broadband interferograms. We can see interferograms of uh, superluminescent diodes, sediment absorption, different notch filters. We're, we have a joint project. Uh, it was just selected for funding with JPL to adapt this for planetary exploration. No moving parts, very low power, great for things like rovers and satellites. Okay, low cost optical switches. A standard way of doing an optical switch is called a mock center switch. Here, instead of having a slab waveguide, you've got channel waveguides. And you basically control the phase of one channel with respect to the other. Then, if you put light in here, depending on the phase relationship between these, you can make it come out either here or here, and vice versa. And you can make switching matrices this way. And this is actually, JDS Uniphase is one of the market leaders in something called Rotom's Reconfigurable Optical Adron Multiplexers. Basically, you've got lots of channels and light coming in, and it redirects it to all the different fibers. It's done with this, you know, the leading technology of you know, all the hype of the telecom era. Well, one hour marketplace was thermal optics, basically heating up the glass, which is amazing to me. Well, we can get rid of thermal optics. So we can do the same thing, except with LC. Here's an example of the device. And so by 25 volts, we've switched multiple times. Uh, we are, I kid you not, 10,000 times less power consumption than thermal optics. 50 to 100 times faster. So here's an example of basically looking at the output of one channel and switching the controls. So you go from one to the other. Your uptime basically happens in under 100 microseconds. And we're 100 times larger index modulation than thermal optics. So you can make the whole thing more compact. OK, we can also do tunable filters. So one way to do a filter is to create a ring structure. So again, this is a channelized device where you basically have light coming in one channel, an output channel, and then a ring channel connecting them. If the wavelength of light coming in fits an integer number of times around this ring, then it will couple from the input to the output. These are called microarrays. Folks have been working on microarrays for 20, 30 years. They almost always do them thermal optically, which always has power consumption problems. So we can do the same thing, but we put LC on top, and we can now tune it with liquid crystal. So here's a device that we built. You've got an input channel and an output channel. And so sitting on one of these output channels, one wavelength, as you apply voltage, we can scan it over multiple, what's called free spectral ranges of the device. And so multiple channels, which enables architectures like this. So let's say you've got multiple channels of light coming in. You can have a bunch of rings that say, OK, take this wavelength channel and direct it down there. Take this wavelength channel and direct it down there. And then each one of these rings can say, OK, now direct it to that fiber, or that fiber, or that fiber. It's a router, but not a router. And this whole thing can be thumbnail sized. And you put a little crystal on top. And then you have a little team pattern electrode, just like a display. It's an optical router using liquid crystal technology, fits on a thumbnail, super low power consumption. So we're excited about that. Another example, you can make tunable laser structures. 
There's lots of ways and lots of people who are working on making tunable lasers. Probably one of the, the biggest ones out there was, um, it's still mechanics. So what they do is they take a diode channel and they have a diffraction ring. And the diffraction grating says, just lays it this way. And then you mechanically tilt that diffraction grating to tune the laser. We can now take that same structure. So this could be a diode chip. It couples into our LC waveguide. You bond an edge bonded grating on there. And then by applying, having beam steer electrodes, instead of tilting the grating, we tilt the light before the grating. It gets rid of all auto mechanics. Another thing you need to do with lasers is, as you tilt the grating, you have to tune the capillary, the optical capillary. And we can do that just with a, a square electrode. And so we built devices for NIST, NSF, EPA. Here's an example of one of our tunable lasers. Here's a device where we tuned over 50 nanometers, which is a lot for tunable dot lasers. Example number six. And you know, again, I can't show you this, but we're working on this for uh, a different government agency. And true time delay for things like optical phase array radar where they want to delay your light pulse by 5 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, and they want it to be tunable. We can make tunable trimmers, uh, analog trimmers, where we can tune them over something like 40 picoseconds, and then digital devices where we can have an 8-bit tuner over 10 nanoseconds. And we're working on, on that as well. So I think I'm nearing the end. I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. I'm doing good. Okay, good. So, Look at just a wave guide. It's an emerging photonics platform, and there's tons and tons of things you can do with it. It's basically, finally, you can get big dot NL. There's all these things that you could never build, you can now build. And so, things like widely tunable lasers, EO beam steers, true time delay, non mechanical spectrometers, optical switches and filters, these are devices that we built at different stages of prototype level. And one of the things that I'm real proud of is that we're funded off of. Government grants. Every time we get a phase one, it always goes to phase two. People are always amazed at how much this technology can do. We've got a hundred percent success rate at, at transition. And so, just to end, you know, I'd like to say that you, know, you go to these talks and these conferences, and you go to the MEM sections, for example, and there's you know, ten thousand professors working on MEMs, and they're all coming up with really clever, great ideas. And look at this away, guys. How many professors are working on those? Well, we have Noel's done some really cool stuff, and there's one group in Ghent, there's one group in Cambridge who's sort of doing a little bit. We would, I would love, we would love for more professors to be working in this field. And so if people want to collaborate, we will you know, get you waveguide substrates, tell you how to couple that into it. Um, we love collaborations like that. We have collaborations with Dave Walpa, and go extremely well, and uh, we'd like to continue that. And also, you know, if people are at all kinds of level, all the way from Engineering levels, you know, there's some really funny service effects that go on in these devices that your LC chemistry is really critical. If you just use standard display LC, you see all these weird phenomena. So, with the crystal chemist and getting the chemistry just right is actually very critical. And so, we're open to folks that just want to play with prototypes or folks that want to be partners in proposals, um, or if you just want to start working on your own and chat with us, we're happy to support you on that too. So, that's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very impressive and exciting presentation. Questions? <laughs> so, I will start with just a small um, question. Um, if, if you reorient the liquids on the RD surface, there might be some geometries in which the um, director yes. has a component that is part of the polarization of light. Yes. And then uh, your transparency how would be as good or you can uh, depending on how you orient it, you can uh, this is one of the things that we were first worried about. Is so if you align your liquid crystal your light, so say your T E polarized, so you polarize like that. And if you align your liquid crystal, so the director is aligning that. As you apply a voltage, you flip it up. Maybe this isn't what you're asking, maybe it is. We were worried that at a certain value, you'd have a director which would basically couple TE to TM and cause all kinds of scattering problems. You can 100% avoid that problem. 
And so the way you do that is, in order for waveguides to couple from one mode to another, you need, there's two parameters that are important. Basically, it's basically a phase matching problem. And so there's an interaction link. You gotta have, have to have a coupling coefficient, but then there's also an energy mismatch. So if you make single mode waveguides that are high enough and fine, you can make this motor propagation and that motor propagation be different enough in energy so there's no problem. And so you know, that, that's one of the keys to making these things work right. If you don't make it right, you can actually efficiently couple from one mode to another, which you know, there might be interesting devices you can do with that too. But there's a real advantage to buffing them that way because you can design it so that way, especially for spectrometers, you can design it so that way as you tilt your liquid crystal up, one polarization speeds up and the other polarization slows down. So you gain a factor of two in the total OPD that you can realize. You improve your spectral resolution by factor two just by choice of how you align the LC. So, thank you. Sure. Yes? Do you notice any alignment layer effects? Yeah, tons. Alignment layer is key. And so, um, keep choosing the right alignment layer. First of all, you want your alignment layer to be very, very thin. And, because uh, that eats into your effect. And so, if your alignment layer is thick, you basically, your, your evanescent field is not interacting with the LC, and you're throwing away your effect. And so, you can use polyamid, but you, you thin it way the heck down. So you've got maybe, you know, 10 nanometer thick layers. Or you can use things like silicon monoxide, silicon dioxide, very thin layers. And uh, there are other advantages to using that. But it, it's super critical to a light layer. That's probably the most important thing. So the... Uh, Steering rates are basically already comparable to that of Gallo mirrors, right? That's right. Have you been thinking about uh, imaging applications for this? Uh, so you can think about uh, it's a in one dimension, it's a single mode device. So you can't do any imaging in that dimension. You can't image through a single mode fiber. In the other dimension, you can. Um, so to get a full 2D image, you have to make a stack of these, which starts to get less elegant. You know, you can do, uh, one way that you can do imaging is, and this is an exciting application for us, is basically laser range finding imaging. So you have a laser beam that you scan out an image, and raster by raster, it basically looks at the reflection of that beam and reconstructs an image that way. That's what folks want to put on UAVs and things like that. And so what you do is you put a little pulse laser in, and then you do time of flight measurement, and uh, you know, I kind of joke, the old Battlestar Galactica, Cylon Warriors. They sometimes were making Cylon eyes. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the old Battlestar Galactica. But science fiction, they always have you know, a laser beam that scans across and you know, gets an image and says, well, that's what we're making. <laughs> and uh, so science fiction, right again. Yes, What's the uh, out of the wavelength uh, for your wave track? When it becomes the long long long? So you can design the waveguide. Uh, that's a good question. This stuff works best in the near infrared. And so 1550 to one micron, it's beautiful. At 650, it still works, but you start to see more losses because of scattering. You go up to, we've done all the way up to 405 nanometers, and it still works, but your attenuation is quite a bit. One waveguide is not going to be single mode over that whole range. And so typically, rule of thumb is you can design a waveguide that has a single mode operation of about 500 nanometers. So we've got devices that can be single mode from one micron to 1550 until they operate over that range. But then you get down to 900, it starts to go multi-mode. One more question. Uh, can you envision using your device uh, uh, for uh, imaging uh, in flight? Sure. Yeah. As long as it's not a continuum. Yeah, so uh, pulse light's flying. The, um, Challenges with pulse light are sometimes you can get high peak powers, and so if you're just pulsing diode lasers, we're fine. You know, you're going to get peak powers of 10, 20 watts. It's not a big deal. Fiber lasers, it gets much bigger, and so we have a proposal pending with another company that has big $20,000 fiber lasers. We're going to crank the power up and see how much we can handle. Uh, I've done some back of the envelope calculations that says we might be able to handle up to sort of 10 nanosecond pulses, maybe get up into the millijoule range, but uh, we haven't proven it yet. And that stuff's always tricky to do back of the envelope calculations with. The other challenge with pulses 
is that your pulse can have uh, can be spectrally impure. And so for the beam steerer, for example, it's a prism. And so you send white light into a prism, and you've got dispersion, and it sends it out. A waveguide has more dispersion than bulk optics because of the geometry effect. It's about a factor two worse. So if your pulses, if your spectral spread is more than five nanometers, you can start to run into problems. But if it's one or two nanometers, you know, it depends on what you mean by fine. Other questions? Have you compared the performance of the miniature TIR to the commercial data ones? How does it compare sensitivity wise? So, sensitivity wise, with FTIR, the, uh, if you do your electronics right, you get shotguns. That's an advantage of FTIR. It's got the throughput or flight error advantage. I forget exactly what it's called. You measure all the photons. And so, as opposed to a, a tunable filter or something like that. The challenge with the FTIR is that it's a single mode waveguide. So you have to get broadband light into a single mode waveguide. There are clever ways to do it with things like superluminescent diodes, which themselves are a waveguide. But if you just hold up a light bulb to the waveguide, you're not going to get much of that light. And so that's, that's one of the challenges. Another challenge with the FTIR is, is dealing with dispersion. So in sensitivity, you can beat it. In terms of spectral breadth, uh, we're still working on some issues. So, like a standard, you know, like an ocean optics little mini guy, and you know, we can beat them on sensitivity, we can beat them on resolution, uh, but they can do you know a thousand nanometers, which if you're looking at low resolution stuff, you all want to be that. You know, we've done four or five hundred nanometers and getting up to a thousand. Your light source starts to be more expensive. Yes. Is there any power limitations for the devices? How much optical power can handle? Yes. Um, there's always power limitations. So it can handle the biggest lasers we've got, but that's not saying much. The uh, <coughs> there's reason to believe that the power handling is going to be quite good. Um, so there's sort of two failure modes that we envision. So the short answer is we don't know yet. You know, we haven't we haven't gotten the big lasers is basically trying to cook these things yet. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, we suspect it's going to be quite good. So if you take things like fiber lasers, in like a nuclear fiber laser, they can get up to 100 watt CW. And it's a single mode confined beam. Our optical confinement is two orders of magnitude less than that. So we're basically we're confined the same amount in one dimension, but we're spread out that much. So the actual power loading is quite a bit less. That said, it's a liquid crystal. And so, <coughs> you know, one failure mechanism is liquid crystals are going to absorb some. And that's going to heat up the LC, which is going to change the temperature. You're going to see nonlinear effects. Now, it's the perfect form factor for removing heat. It's a pancake. That's what you want if you want to suck heat out. And so the thermal conductivity of silicon is very, very high. And so we can put a TEC right there and suck that heat out. You run the equations, it says you're going to be able to handle it to four or five hundred watts. I don't believe it. Uh, certainly, you know, tens, tens of watts are no problem. Getting it a hundred watts, we don't know yet. And then pulsed is a, I don't know if you're asking CW or pulsed. Uh, CW. CW, okay. Okay, before we move further with the Depends on what you want to do. So pneumatics are nice because you can get very big birefringences. Birefringencies. Uh, so for our beam steer devices, the standard one is using pneumatics. We're, we built devices with uh, specific materials, which are much faster. And so those are attractive, but still in the development stage. So pneumatics is the most. Any other questions? Yes. And how precise you can scan the beam, it's analog. And so, how 
good can you pull your analog voltages? So if let's say we make a beam here that steers 50 degrees, and that happens over 100 volts per you, if you can handle that 100 volts, control that down to the middle level, then you know that's important to the numbers. And so in principle, it could be that good. Now it gets the doubles and detail these things. So you know, we've been thinking of schemes of doing uh, feedbacks, so instead of driving the voltage, you drive at an angle. Um, the small temperature effects and the heat effects. So it's kind of an odd answer. In principle, it's good if you can control your electronics, but of course there are other issues. Yes, sir. What are the drive I'm sorry, can you say that again? How much are the drive voltages? It depends on how much how you design your waveguide. So uh, we typically design our waveguides so only about 10% of the light is in the, the field. And then it's an order of magnitude faster than normal pneumatics, but the cost you pay is the drive voltage goes up in order of magnitude. So instead of having to go to 10 volts, you have to go to 100 volts. If you don't care about the speed, you can design that down. And so it'll be slower, but it'll happen at a lower voltage. So in the range of 10 to 100 volts, something like that. Which is why we have a 100 volt LC driver. Any other questions? If not, let us thank you for the game.